Coming up on DTNS, Europe charges Amazon with antitrust. Huawei may sell its Honor set handset business. And Apple announces new Macs with the Apple Made M1 chip. This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, November 10th, 2020 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. In Salt Lake City, I'm normally Wednesday, Scott Johnson. And I'm the show's producer, Roger Chang. And uh, for the third month in a row, we got an Apple announcement, which means for the third month in a row, we get the hosts of Snob OS uh, back on the show. Nika Monford, welcome back. Hello, glad to be back. Good to have you. Terrence Gaines, good to have you back, too. Yo, what's going on, everybody? Oh, we got more Apple stuff to talk about. In fact, if you want a wider conversation of of more what we're all going to do as far as like which a, which Apple products we might be interested in and when, uh, we talked about that quite a bit on Good Day Internet. Get that wider conversation. Become a member at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Spotify confirmed it has acquired Megaphone, a podcast host and ad company. Spotify uses Megaphone's hosting tools. In a press release, Spotify said that the acquisition will let it offer podcast publishers more innovative revenue tools, including the opportunity to opt in to have their content monetized. Alphabet's X division has renamed its Free Space Optical Communications project to be called Project Tara, T-A-A-R-A. -A -A. It uses laser beaming boxes up to 20 kilometers apart in line of sight to deliver 20 gigabit per second backhaul internet. This isn't for your home use. This is you know, to provide internet connectivity that can then be delivered on to home use. Project Tara is now formally working with Econet to support its liquid telecom subsidiary in Kenya. Ubisoft's channel on the Amazon Luna game streaming service is now live. The channel is an additional $15 per month. It's part of Ubisoft Plus, so you can access games across platforms as well. Security researchers revealed a new side channel attack against Sandy Bridge and newer Intel chips called Platypus. It can remotely use the running average power limiter, RAPL. It's a power meter that is in the chip, and it can use that power meter to infer values, including crypto keys, in the SGX enclave, so in the secure enclave, just by reading those power fluctuations. And it can do it remotely. Intel is elevating the privileges needed to access the RAPL power meter and a microcode fix that will limit reported energy consumption to mitigate the risk. Crypto algorithms that are time constant can prevent the side channel attack from working, so developers ought to employ those. There is no indication that these vulnerabilities were exploited in the wild. Energy meter chips from AMD and others, however, may be vulnerable to similarly constructed attacks. Hey, remember when a musical concert in Fortnite was kind of a big deal? Very yeah. novel. How strange. What are they doing? That was then. This is now. November 14th, Roblox will host a virtual Lil Nas X concert with an Old West setting for Old Town Road, a darker stage for Rodeo, and a futuristic city for his song Panini. The sets are open now. Friday's a pre-show broadcast Q&A that begins then, and Saturday afternoon is the show, which will be replayed two more times to hit all time zones worldwide. Roblox is the new concert hall. Uh, Reuters sources say Huawei intends to sell Honor Terminal Company Limited uh, to a group led by Honor's main handset distributor, Digital China. Digital China will finance the deal with some bank loans and at least three other investment firms backed by the government of the town of Shenzhen, China. Uh, they'll each own about 10 to 15 percent. Honor plans to retain its 7,000 plus workforce and keep its plans to go public in three years. Sources say U.S. restrictions on Huawei are forcing Huawei to focus on its high end phones. And Honor would theoretically be free of those restrictions as an independent company. A deal could be reached as early as Sunday. All right, let's talk about those antitrust allegations. European Commissioner Marguerite Vestier announced a preliminary conclusion uh, that Amazon has violated antitrust rules in the way it treats European merchants. After a year-long investigation, the European Commission determined that Amazon breached competition rules by accessing non-public data from merchants to help its own products and services. Amazon will have a chance to respond in the coming weeks. Amazon says it uses sales and store data to improve the customer experience. They admit that. But things like suggesting items you're interested in are what they say they use it for. Amazon says it prohibits employees from using, quote, non-public seller-specific data to determine which private label products to launch. So they're saying, no, we don't do that. 
Vestier also said the EU has opened a second formal antitrust investigation into whether Amazon gave preferential treatment to its own products and to sellers who paid extra for Amazon logistics and delivery services. So they have a preliminary allegation that Amazon can respond to, that it violated antitrust rules for using data it collected from third-party sellers, but there's an investigation into whether it actually gave preferential treatment to its own products, whether it used that data or not. Uh, and don't forget the U.S. Federal Trade Commission is also conducting its own investigation into Amazon. No findings on that have been announced yet, but uh, Amazon under the gun in a few different places. So, okay, if they, they're pulling data from somebody that, let's say I buy a, a power strip and I get an Amazon Essentials power strip. The accusation is, and I'm not being specific about that, obviously, but the accusation is that maybe they have data from other mainline power strip sellers and they're like, oh, interesting. We're seeing a real uptick in um, six outlet UPC based whatever. And so they start selling one of their own as an Essentials product and at a very low price. That's and then it drives the out the original sellers. Yeah, right. that, that's okay. the allegation. That's the accusation, yeah. Yeah, it seems yeah, to me that Yeah, or something the minute... in the product summary, you know, that people are responding well to, you know, all that stuff is is data that Amazon gets. We talked about this when, when, when the EU investigation started. The, you know, and there are others that accuse Amazon of this is, the company saying, "Well, no, we don't do this. If if this was happening at the company, it's it's wrong." And I, you know, I I just sort of think, okay, what is the likelihood that somebody in one of the vast departments at a huge global company like Amazon is like, you know, I really just want to, you know, I want to be like the, you know, the selling winner. So I'm going to do this secretly, and and upper management won't know that I did this. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's possible. It's and Bezos has not denied that that's possible. He's like, we, I don't know if someone has done this, but I'm not aware of it if it's happened. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The minute you put something up that says, our brand is the minute you start to think about these things happening in the future. So anyway, they're reaping the whirlwind now. Autonomous vehicle startup Cruise announced a partnership with Walmart. Yeah, that's right. Walmart to deliver orders from Scottsdale, Arizona, Walmarts. Uh, the pilot pilot is scheduled to begin in early 2021 using Cruise's electric self-driving Chevy Bolts, not Volt, Bolt. Uh, the number of cars in the pilot was wasn't disclosed, but uh, all will let's see, uh, all will have at least one safety driver behind the wheel, which is important. Cruise and DoorDash completed a delivery pilot in San Francisco in 2019 and have partnered on delivery prepared meals from food banks to San Francisco this year or in San Francisco. And Walmart has partnered for delivery pilot programs with uh, Un Undelv. Am I saying that right? I think so. You Delve. Undelv. Undelv. You Delve. Like you Delve. Yeah, like me, like you. You Delve. <laughs> in Surprise, Arizona. Neuro in Houston. Postmates and Ford uh, in Miami-Dade County, Florida, and Gaddick in Bentonville, Arkansas. So the the upshot here is Walmart is out there piloting all kinds of autonomous delivery to try to get an edge on Amazon, which I don't think is involved in any autonomous delivery. Maybe they're smart, maybe it's a waste of time, but uh, you know, I, I, I think it's interesting to note that that Walmart is keeping in the game here by, by trying a lot of different pilots, hopefully to be able to have an edge in fast delivery. They just launched that, that new program where you pay a little extra and you can get two hour delivery on stuff. Terrence, have you, you ever ordered delivery from Walmart? I've done it maybe once or twice myself. Uh, actually, my wife has really been trying to get us off of the Amazon train. Well, let me not say off of it, but she's really starting to recognize how comparable they are as far as the uh, delivery. So she has actually for groceries and just now starting the Christmas routine, she's ordering more stuff off of there. And they are trying to be super competitive. So I can see how Walmart's starting to throw things at the dartboard to see what sticks. And I mean, if Amazon is not doing autonomous vehicle delivery, then I mean, why not? Yeah. Weird thing happened last night. We ordered groceries from Walmart because we wanted to try it. And did, instead of our regular place, they sent us to the wrong Walmart. Wasn't a big deal. It's only 10 minutes difference, but we had to wait there for a while before we found out we were at the wrong one. And they were all confused. Went to the other Walmart, waited, waited, waited. And then the one thing that we were going to make last night that was the big deal in the groceries was salmon. And the one thing they came out with when the order was finally ready was their list of things they didn't have. And the only mm -hmm. thing they didn't have was salmon. Of course. So it wasn't a great experience. But also, I think this is indicative of a lot of this sort of stuff right now. And I hope 
uh, uh, rather Walmart being in the mix maybe shakes things up and makes things more competitive and that helps everybody. So I'm okay with it. Yeah. No fish for me though today. <laughs> well, and as, as, as people continue to be a little wary about, am I going to get, by, you know, in the car with a car driving itself and do I feel safe? And, you know, even with safety drivers, it's for some people, it's, it's a, it's a big leap, but saying, well, I want that, that salmon <laughs> at that Walmart and I'd like it to be delivered to me. And if the car can get here safely, that would be fine. Yeah. You know, I think, you know, we're kind of, we're bridging the gap. Yeah. Well, thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit. You can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com. It definitely helps us put together the lineup every single day. So we talked about those Apple laptops, and uh, they are all powered by Apple Silicon. This is an uh, ARM-based chip designed by Apple for its laptops. It'll replace the Intel chips over the next couple of years. Uh, so we got the name of it. I was really angling for it to be like an A14X or something, but it's the M1. Uh, the M1 chip is the first system on a chip for Mac. System on a chip means everything's integrated. Uh, you don't have it. A, a CPU and then a GPU and then a neural engine on the motherboard. It's all in one little package that includes a unified memory architecture, uh, integrated GPU, neural engine, and more. It's the first 16 billion transistor, five nanometer chip. Uh, so it is an advanced ARM design as well. Eight core CPU, four of them are high performance cores, four are high efficiency cores. And Apple said that those high efficiency cores on their own deliver similar performance to the current dual core Mac Air. Uh, and those are only half the cores. That doesn't even include the high performance cores. Uh, best performance per watt, they say, of any chip out there. Uh, they did a lot of comparisons, a quarter of the power to the leading PC chip to get the same maximum performance up to an eight core integrated GPU that peaks out at 2.6 teraflops. They call it the world's fastest integrated graphics chip, peak performance of PC GPU to a third of the power of an equivalent PC. 16 core neural engine with 11 trillion processes per second, Thunderbolt, Secure Enclave, and uh, the three Macs, uh, the MacBook Pro, 13 inch MacBook Pro, MacBook Air, and the Mac Mini pre-order now, shipping next week. Uh, how, how do we feel about this chip before we get into the actual designs of the laptops? Well, I mean, it sounds super rad. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm excited about all the promises. Um, there's a lot of language in their presentation that was like, hey, um, this is a really fast chip compared to other integrated GPUs. Like, th there's important words in there, and they used it, and they, they, they used the, some of that speak to make it sound like things were better than a desktop with discrete GPU and that sort of thing. And they're not, obviously, but I'm excited about these chips. I think it's great. I just hate the transition period. Yeah, I mean, it. It what is being promised sounds very promising. Uh, I, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to be the first person to get one of these laptops because I want someone else to tell me, yeah, this is the real deal. Or huh, I'm a little, you know, I'm, you know, I it was a little lackluster from 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 what I thought I was getting, and it also depends on what you do on your on your on your MacBook. We were talking before the show. I'm not really in the upgrade period right now, so I can kind of sit back and wait, which is the place I like to be safely, uh, because yeah, it, it's a new era, but very cool. Again, like you said, Scott, it's a it's a really impressive product and it remains to be seen whether or not real world benchmarks prove it to be as um, illustrious as uh, the the brochure that they gave on this live stream uh, uh, says it is but it's actually very impressive and the fact that they have confidence that they can move over their entire line to their in-house silicon uh, is a testament to how much they think how much performance they think they can wring out of this architecture yeah, and also Tom Tom mentioned this to me earlier because I have concerns about the memory stuff because I don't really understand how unified memory works and all of that, and I just need to read more about it. But, you know, them going from 64 gigabytes available on the Mac Mini on the Intel uh, product to 16 maximum here, 8 standard, and then from everything I hear, they're saying, no, that's that's okay because this architecture makes it so memory is less key in this in this entire equation. I that's like words I've never heard in my life about RAM. It's, so I'm I'm excited to learn more about that because I want to understand that more. And I'm all for less RAM if we don't need it. But 
it's scary to me. Those I sorts think of it's things. I think it's not so much less RAM as you don't need as much RAM to cache data that you used to because you had a set even if you have an SSD on on say like a SATA connector, it's still slower than your than your RAM. But if they designed the the memory through the unified memory architecture fast enough, you could conceivably bring memory from your storage to your memory faster than you could before and you wouldn't have the same latency issues. Mm. Yeah, and I agree the specs look fantastic. And if they can deliver on what the specs say, I think it's going to be a great chip. I think what the hard sell is going to be, as you mentioned, Roger, is that the fact that you don't need as much RAM. We aren't used to hearing that. We aren't used to lower amounts of RAM for this type of, of capability. So I think there are going to be, I suspect in the next week or so, a lot of skepticism around if this chip can actually deliver what they're saying can deliver without having to have as much RAM. So um, it should be interesting to see how it plays out. Got to see some benchmarks. Yeah. Yep. Like, because this may be like gigahertz. We don't look at the gigahertz on the CPU like we used to. It used to be that every every CPU had to have faster gigahertz than the previous version. Now we know the bottom the the bottlenecks are elsewhere. Uh, so that that's kind of what Apple's trying to say. And and I'll, I'll be interested, like you said, Roger, to see see what the benchmarks tell the tale. Uh, let's talk about some of these laptops though. MacBook Air, uh, which they, you know, they say it's faster CPU, faster graphics than previous MacBook Airs, uh, faster than the best-selling Windows laptop, you know, all the numbers. Uh, no fan. This thing is silent. Uh, and they're claiming 15 hours of battery life for web browsing on wireless, 18 hours of video playback, which would be six hours more than the last MacBook Air. Uh, who's in? On a $999 MacBook Air, that's the starting price, or $899 for education. Uh, anybody impressed by the MacBook Air? I'm definitely impressed. Uh, I also saw that they included two Thunderbolt ports. I can't remember if some of the yep. older MacBook Airs just had the one. So they've added another Thunderbolt, which is, I guess, good uh, for yeah, yeah. all the peripherals and if you need to be a docket, monitor, all the good stuff. But $99, $999 for, I mean, a better MacBook Air, which is like the basic one that everybody gets, especially for kids and my, and you know, and the, which is all this virtual learning. Because they also mentioned that the twice as long video conferencing, so all the Zoom and the Google Meets and all that good stuff. So I'm I'm definitely interested to see how people take to this. I mean, I kind of want a new MacBook, but I'm not I'm not in a huge rush because my iPad Pro 2019 Rev iPad Pro is kind of taken over. I never thought it would, but it is. And um, I'm getting just more out of it with that keyboard accessory than I expected. So I don't think I'm in the market for it, but but it still looks great. And the, that kind of performance out of an Air, I mean, that's, the Airs are famous for being kind of poopy on the performance side, but just being uber thin and worth it because they weigh nothing. You can take them anywhere and they're super cool that way. But now it sounds like, I don't know, the style actually has a performance to match and that's exciting. Yeah, and the no fan thing, e room. even mm -hmm. though that's, it's sort of, you know, some people would be like, I mean, I don't really think about fans anyway, whether they're inside my computer or not. I can't tell you how many times I've been on a podcast, you know, maybe walking somebody through, you know, tech specs. And I'm like, is there a, is your window open or what is that noise? Oh, it's your <laughs> MacBook Air. It's the fan, you know, because it's working yeah. really hard. So this is actually <laughs> going to be advantageous for folks. Yeah. The only fan will be you sitting in front of it. Being a fan of House Island, it is. Uh, <laughs> Mac Mini, I know you're you're leaning this way, Scott. Uh, faster, 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 of course, has a fan, uh, but only two Thunderbolt USB-C ports, two USB-A ports, mini jack still there, headphone jack, HDMI, and Ethernet. Uh, also, not 10 gig Ethernet. Don't know that that matters for most people. Most people can't take advantage of it, but uh, it's still there on the Intel version. Yeah, it's a little bit weird for them to pull back. I like the $100 cheaper thing. Obviously, yeah, that's just a nice thing. Mm -hmm. It's a nice thing to hear, right? Like, oh, they're actually going to go down a little bit for better specs in theory. But taking out two of those ports is a little concerning, but not a deal breaker. There are also plenty of splitters and hubs now. It's not like that that big of a deal to expand if you need more Thunderbolt. Um, the GPU is also way faster than the current gen to the point that I don't think people are going to need, unless they really have a special need for it, they're not going to need eGPUs, which currently there's no driver for, so who knows what that all means. But as someone who uses a Mac Mini for almost all of my production, multiple monitors, maxed out specs, the biggest surprise to me was, again, the memory previously being max maximal to 64 gigabytes locked at 16. 
just shook me for a minute. And again, like you said about megahertz and gigahertz, we may be getting to a place where we don't have to think so much about that number now. And I'm okay with that. Like RPMs on hard drives. We don't have to think about those anymore. Why? Because SSD is here and it's just getting faster and bigger. So I'm actually all for that future. But I have to admit, it. I just took a little bit of a step back and went, now, wait a minute. Do I want to upgrade? Because that's a lot less memory. That's not even, even if I could go 32, it's less than I have right now. And will that matter? OS 10 has always been, and Mac OS has always been a pig with RAM. Um, but it sounds like a brave new world with that chip and a different kind of architecture in it feels a little bit like I just have to jump in and find out for myself. So waiting for the benchmark marks, waiting for the reviews. We'll see. That's the refrain, waiting for the benchmarks. All right, we got one more to talk about. 13-inch MacBook Pro, three pounds. Uh, we didn't get 15-inch MacBook Pro with Apple Silicon or M1, uh, just the 13-inch. Uh, this one has the two Thunderbolt USB-C ports, 17 hours of web on wireless battery claim, 20 hours video playback, which is 10 more than the last generation. It, they said it could compile four times as much code on a charge uh, as the previous version. They also made a big deal about the quality of the built-in mic, uh, which as a podcaster, I'm like, well, I'm never using that, but okay, studio quality three mic array. Uh, and uh, starting at $1,299, $1,199 for education. So uh, basically the same price as the previous 13-inch MacBook Pro. Uh, Nika, I know you were saying this is the one, if any of them, that seemed to, to catch your eye if you're going to be caught at all. Yeah, this one, um, it did catch my eye because I am in the market for a new uh, a new MacBook. It's, it's time for an upgrade for me. Uh, my only thing was the 13 inch. I really wanted a, a larger screen. So um, I'm, I'm impressed with what they say it can do. Um, so again, you know, the theme of the day, waiting for the benchmark to see what it comes back as. And I would be interested to see what the rollout schedule is for the the remainder of the line to see mm -hmm. i guess how long it's going to take for them to to start to to roll it out we know that uh, i think they said uh fall was it of 2022 um that's the so end, end date right they end date have of, all of, having, of them replaced by then have, yeah right that's the idea anyway right so it'll be interesting to see what's slated for for the next release i'm, I'm definitely intrigued and i'm definitely weighing on should i go ahead and and jump on board but uh i'm still a little hesitant but based on what i've seen i I'm, I'm impressed especially my sticking point was i originally thought well once they announce the new silicon i'll get the the last version before silicon because i was expecting it to be significantly more but um the price uh, so far for for what they've released in in this last uh Apple event has been on par with with previous devices. So I guess we'll see. Yeah, and I was going to say, I wonder, I think on the Good Day Internet, we all talked about, you know, we're waiting on the larger one. I'm curious as to why they did not announce a 15-inch alongside it. I mean, they could, I mean, I don't know how much extra time they had. I don't know what the, the you know, rollout from the 16-inch MacBook Pro, but mm -hmm. I, I don't see it being as complicated to say, we also have a 15 inch and not have to go into the specifics on how they differ or whatever. So I'm curious as to why they did not announce a yeah, 15 inch yeah. alongside it. I mean, I think a lot of it is that the 13 inch MacBook Pro is the form factor a lot of people like. Uh, you know, they think they're going to sell a lot of them. And hasn't it gone the longest since it had an upgrade? Because we just got the 16 inch MacBook yeah, Pro. Yeah. yeah. I'm I'm partial to the 13. That's that's the that's the one that I've had for for the last four years, and I had a 13 inch before that too, but it, it was an error. Um, and you know, 15. It, so I also had a MacBook Pro that was 17 inches back when we were doing that whole thing. Oh right, um, I remember that. Yeah, in fact, I still have it. It's it's my it's my very very last backup, <laughs> but it works. Um, and that looks ridiculous to me now. But I kind of, I, you know, Nika, when you say you're more interested in the 15 because you want those. A, a, a couple more inches. I kind of get that because I do spend a lot of time at my laptop and it's not plugged into an, an external monitor of any kind. And it might be kind of nice. Yeah. Because I currently use a 13 inch. And so, mm. uh, after using it for a while, I'm like, yeah, it's, it's nice. But the fact that we're spending a lot more time at home and not necessarily out, uh, it's, it, it's become apparent that I would prefer a larger screen. 
All right. One last thing uh, was the announcement that Big Sur is available for pretty much uh, all Macs, Intel or Apple Silicon, uh, at least uh, of the last several years. Thursday, November 12th. Uh, this is built for M1. Uh, and if you're on the new Apple Silicon, you'll get instant wake from sleep. Uh, they claim Safari will be one and a half times speedier at JavaScript, 1.9 times more responsive. But the big question for people on M1-based Macs will be, can I get the apps? Well, Apple made all of its apps available. That was expected. Uh, and then they noted the three categories, which they talked about at WWDC, universal apps, uh, so apps that are made with a native binary for Apple Silicon and Intel can run on either one. Photoshop will be a universal app next year. Lightroom next month. Uh, other apps are, are going to be universal as well. If it's not universal, if it's compiled for x86, you can do Rosetta 2. Uh, Rosetta 2 will run your Intel-based maps on the M1. Apple tried to convince us that some of those even run better on the M1 than they do natively on Intel. I'm a little skeptical of that, but we'll see. Uh, and then there's the fact that it's an ARM-based processor, so the M1-based uh, Macs can run all iOS and iPad apps. Uh, in fact, by default, all iOS and iPad apps will show up in the Mac store if you have an mm -hmm. M1-based Mac. But many companies are opting out of that. Google has opted out almost all of its offer offerings. Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, and Messenger all opted out. Snapchat, Amazon Prime Video, Disney+, Plus, uh, the games Candy Crush, Among Us, and Real Racing 3 all opted out, probably because they want to tweak the interface before they have that run on a laptop, or maybe they just don't want it to run on a laptop at all. Yeah, Terrence, I heard you give a little giggle there. Well, I, I was just going to say, it's something I saw a tweet um, as to somebody was asking, well, well, then why can't I run Big Sur or Mac OS in general on an iPad? Well, I think this is the answer now because all of the apps have backed out of it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, and they they uh, they they don't want to do touchscreen on laptops, so there's you know there's that difference too. But yeah, it's a good question. Oh my gosh, I didn't even really thought about this. They're now closer than ever, like at a fundamental level, with this change in what CPUs they're using and all this integration. They're closer than they've ever been to one unified platform, and this app initiative is is another version or is, is another proof a piece of proof of that. So why don't they just go all the way and say, I don't know, they're basically making Windows 8 here. Like they're, they're basically uh, at a point where they can make that decision and say, okay, sure, our laptops don't have touch, but are still mostly mouse focused and the tablet's still mostly touch, but it's a little mouse focused because we got that new keyboard accessory. Like they really are skimming the edges now. And I hadn't really considered that until you said that. All right. Uh, well, there you go. That's uh, that's the new Apple Silicon-based uh, products, uh, as we said, available for pre-order now, shipping next week. Uh, before we go, let's check out the mailbag. This one comes in from Nick with a K. Nick says, today I got the first of my new consoles that are coming this week, the Xbox Series X. Personally, I'm disappointed. I wasn't expecting a revolutionary experience or anything crazy like that. After all, Microsoft themselves have positioned this console as more of a continuation of the Xbox One than anything else. However, I was expecting the little issues from the Xbox One family to be finally fixed. So far, I've had some of the same issues that people have been running into for nearly a decade on the Xbox One. I've had games refuse to launch, cloud save downloads fail, and require a retry, a slow Xbox Live download speed, all examples. That said, at least Microsoft has finally fixed the slow speed of the Xbox console. So if you're contemplating one Xbox Series X purchase, maybe temper your expectations slightly if Xbox One system level issues annoyed you. Uh, it sounds like, uh, uh, Scott, uh, check me on this. It sounds like what Nick experienced was all the things that hardware could fix got fixed, but it's still using Xbox software and services, and maybe yeah. that didn't get fixed yet. Yeah, the, my, the Xbox Series X and X are in a weird position because in terms of actual new games taking advantage of all the guts of those things, we've talked about many times on the show, they're not really ready yet. So this console is more of a continuation of the Xbox One family and a way to play all your old games and all the backwards compatibility and services with Game Pass and all of that. That's clearly the focus, at least at launch, until we get ray tracing magic and stuff from other games. But for now, I don't know that I would say, I, I would give it a little bit more time before you're too disappointed. Basically, these the kinds of things he's describing, and while frustrating, I'll agree, they're also, we're, we're in the middle of a launch week. We're in the middle of them trying to figure stuff out, and a lot of that stuff comes up late in the game. 
I suspect this stuff will get looked at quick, fixed quick, uh, lots of quick patches here and there to make sure it, uh, that, we're, that we're better off. And I would also argue that if, even if you're a Sony fan like I am, you're going to have... And, uh, making sure all this stuff's up to snuff. So not unlike Apple changing chips mid, uh, midstream, we're talking about a new console launch, and there are always these kinds of bugs. So I'd give it a little bit of time, and, and it'll it'll suss itself out. You'll be all right. Well, Paris, thanks, are you Nick. in the Xbox universe? <laughs> I am, but I'm not as much of a gamer, so I did not, I do not recognize some of these issues that Nick is having. So I guess my question would be, how widespread are some of these issues? Or are they nitpicky things that he specifically experienced? Because I haven't experienced those, but again, I'm not a heavy, heavy gamer. I don't have the, you know, big rig with all the HDMI and 4K and Dolby Atmos and all that good stuff. So uh, I have a smaller setup, but I'm curious as how widespread these are. And then to co-sign the fact that this is launch week and I'll mm -hmm. probably try to fix this stuff as fast as possible. Yeah. I mean, the other thing I'd say is like cloud save downloads not coming down. That's something Microsoft will fix or they better because their huge strategy about cloud gaming depends on that going well. So I don't suspect that lasts very long. Certain games not launching, temporary glitch could be fixed with patches. Um, they easily have the most backwards compatible library in terms of volume av available and ready to go for your X and your S right away. So Will there be a couple of oddballs? There always is. They're outliers for the most part. Um, I, I I don't want to come off as an apologist for any of this, but I think it's hard to look at it on day one and make all those judgments on any generational shift. It's always like this, even back in the non-internet connected days. And thankfully now we can get quick patches and updates and, and they can also communicate with us in a much easier way over social media or whatever. So I actually think, uh, Nick, I think your your future is bright if this is your investment and for those getting Sony consoles, expect some issues, but your future is also bright. Happy time for gamers. Nothing wrong with this. We're excited. Well, thanks, Nick, for the email, and thanks to everybody who emails us every day. If you have something on your mind, you can send us an email. Feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. All right, let's shout out patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Carmine Bailey, Justin Zellers, and Miss Music Teacher. Also, thanks to Scott Johnson for being with us today. I know it's Tuesday, but, you know, it, it felt like you had been here every Tuesday all along. <laughs> What's wow. been going on with you? I got Tuesday all over me. So a lot of people <laughs> hear me on here, and they know I do a bunch of podcasts and other stuff. Uh, I work with Tom and other projects and all kinds of cool things. But did they know that I created a weekly comic called Fred and Can? That's right. A guy that lives with a sentient can of expired cream corn and their adventures every week in comic form at fredandcan.com. Go check it out. Let me know what you think. I would love for you to discover this weird comic with me. And the Snob OS cast folks, Nika Monford and Terrence Gaines, like Tom said at the beginning of the show, we've gotten very familiar with each other. <laughs> <Very>. <laughs> Maybe there'll be another Apple announcement next month. Who knows? Uh, let folks know where they can keep up with your work in the meantime. You can find us on snobowestcast.com. Um, that's where we host um, the podcast and some other information. And also we are on all podcast platforms. You can also find me on all social media outlets. I'm at Tech Savvy Diva everywhere. And you can find me on all the social medias at Brother Tech, B-R-O-T-H-A. I know a lot of people do brother, but I tried to mm. try to funk it up a little bit. So I'm Brother Tech. <laughs> All right, folks, if you need just the headlines, uh, if you're like, you know, I love listening to Daily Tech News Show, but sometimes I only got five minutes, well, check out our related show, Daily Tech Headlines, all the essential tech news in just about five minutes at dailytechheadlines.com. We are live on this show Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2130 UTC. Put it on your calendar and find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are off tomorrow for Veterans Day in the U.S., but we will be back on Thursday with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>